Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thung Athletes and welcome to the 2080 Fullcast. I am your host, Malt Char, and on this episode, we're yet again talking about classic British superheroes because the Smash Special is out this week from 2080.com. Uh, this is the revival of uh, classic British superhero characters such as uh, Steel Claw, the Spider, Might at the Mighty, Johnny Future, House of Dolman, Thunderbolt, and Cursitor doom as well that last one's got a little bit of a guest appearance by uh yet another one um it's fantastic i've read the entire thing cover to cover really enjoyed it and uh hope you enjoyed the last episode where we were talking to some of the creators involved more interviews this episode from creators involved in the smash special including uh suya davis akamboya uh who is a brand new creator for comics but not for Rebellion. He's somebody who's uh, had his debut novel published by Rebellion Publishing not so long ago, and uh, he's now doing comics for us, which is fantastic. And then we talk to, well, two people whose work I absolutely uh, have adored uh, over the years, Charlie Higson, who... Many of you will know from uh, The Fast Show, uh, which, uh, you know what, when I was a teenager, I used to just block quote that, um, I'm sure to the delight and amusement of all those around me, uh, and Charlie Adlard, a creator who got his break at 2000 AD and the magazine, uh, but has gone on to popular acclaim with The Walking Dead series of comics which you know may or may not have been turned into a, a tv show who knows um so we talked to all three creators uh, over the course of this episode do make sure you get your copy of the smash special go along to shop.2080.com to uh yeah get a slice of classic british comics action um lots of stuff coming up in uh, future episodes of the 2080 Throwcast. Thank you again for all the feedback and suggestions. If you've got a creator or a subject or a series that you'd like us to do a deep dive on or to interview, drop us a line at Thrillcast or one word, Thrillcast at 2080.com. For those of you who aren't reading 2080 on a regular basis but enjoying the podcast, now is your chance to get on board with The Galaxy's Greatest Comic. Next week, Prog 2184 uh, will be a jumping on issue and uh, we're very much looking forward to uh, unveiling new Dread Epic. We've got uh, New Slain coming up fairly soon. We've got Full Tilt Boogie as well. It, it, you know, These are series that have uh, uh, been very eagerly waiting f- uh, to uh, show to the, uh, the Squat Stick Thargo out there. So yeah, um, if you've not subscribed to 2000 AD, jump on board. Lots of really great incentives at the moment. And uh, there's also an offer on digital subscriptions where you get your first month free if you take out a monthly subscription for 2000 AD or the Judge Dredd magazine. We're going to crack on with uh, a chat with Suyi, who is the writer on uh, the Mighty the Mighty Strip on the Smash special. <laughs> So, for those uh, of our listeners who, who, who don't know you, don't know your work, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, okay. Um, I'm Sui Davies Okungboa. Um, I'm a Nigerian author of science fiction, fantasy, horror, pretty much speculative work around, um, you know, along the spectrum. And um, I've been writing for, you know, since 2012. Uh, and and I published a bunch of short stories, but also my debut novel was actually published by Rebellion in 2019. It's called David Mogul, God Hunter. Um, it's about a demigod in Lagos, um, Nigeria. And uh, I also have a forthcoming fantasy trilogy from um, Orbit. Uh, it's called The Nameless Republic, and it should be dropping in 2021. Um, and so my tech is pretty much my third, uh, my tech, the mighty, which is what I wrote for 2000 AD is pretty much my third uh, major thing outside of various short stories that I've published. 
great. I mean, it, I, I, having read it, I love, I love the, I love, <laughs> I love the story. I love the artwork. It's great. Um, t- uh, tell us a little bit about how this, how this came about. Because, like you said, you've, you've already been published by by our colleagues at uh, Rebellion Publishing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rebellion was um, so. I, I think I, I David Moore, who who's the editor at uh, Rebellion Publishing. Um, I, I believe he name dropped, you know, uh, dropped my name when uh, the folks at 2000 AD were thinking about reviving some of the um, comics from the British uh, repository, I believe. Uh, and and my tech was one of those that had a very uh, difficult or contentious origin. <laughs> and they wanted, they were looking for someone who had worked in that area before um, who had written in something that had a deep roots in Africa uh, and they'd already worked with me before and they were like, why don't, you know, why don't you give it a shot? Uh, why don't you see? And I had seen my tech at least once before, but I don't think it was the English version. It was uh, the French one. Um, I think it was called King Kong Le Robot or so. Um, <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, this sounds interesting. Um, and it was a good way to subvert that you know, typical genre of something coming out of Africa that is, you know, somewhat exotic. Uh, and instead, this time we could reframe the narrative in a way that centered um, the, the folks um, where the story was set. And so that's kind of what I set out to do. And it was actually a very fun ride. It was very interesting. I really loved playing with. Uh, and I really hope that we get to do some more of that. Because as, as you say, MyTech is one of those characters very much rooted in let's say colonial attitudes uh, <laughs> of, of, of the past but I, I just the central concept itself is so quirky is a giant solar powered robot gorilla <laughs> yeah 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 it's it's a dope concept in my opinion um it, it's a bit you know tricky because as you said it has like these very str- to sort of um appeal to the natives of the place that um, the colonial scientists were working in that's the that's the real origin story uh and and uh my tech was sort of supposed to be like um an intermediary maybe uh but um we decided all right we i mean there's no way we can sort of like rewrite that in history so instead what we did was how how about we sort of reframe um how my tech can be um understood perceived employed right uh, and that's sort of what we decided um, we decided to like reposition that and and i think right now with where the story is going we're doing a really good job of that when uh when you started to look at this as a script as, as, as a concept was was this a daunting process or or did the solution kind of present itself immediately yeah i would say that, <laughs> i would say the position um I'd say presented itself because um, we were sure what we did not want from the beginning, right? We were sure that, all right, we are definitely doing away with these origins. We were sure we're going to um, sort of harken back to it. We're going to point back and be like, this is where this robot came from. Um, but we wanted to frame that as, as um, not just for the story, uh, not just for us, but for the characters in the story as that's what we do not want to happen anymore. Right. Uh, and that's kind of what happens in the first issue of my tech where um, uh, no spoilers, the characters think about where my tech has been, you know, uh, upon rediscovery. Uh, and so um, I think I kind of like that because, you know, it's it's not we, it, what we're trying to do is not necessarily erase what is existent, but sort of um, lean more towards progressiveness that well okay that has happened but we could you know do better and we're all doing better and and this is both 2000 AD and the characters in the in the story so yeah it wasn't daunting um and it was it was the character itself it's you know my tech as a character is has so much potential you know uh, a Godzilla type you know, I, I think of, I thought of, uh, I keep telling people that my tech is sort of a cross between Godzilla and Pacific Rim. <laughs> you know, it's like somewhere in between. And I like that idea, you know, of, of something that, that, that has, you know, how sentience, also how um, control um, and, you know, 
huge in this way that is coveted by various people all over the world. Uh, it, it presents very a lot of opportunities that I'm hoping that can be exploited. Because you, you'll um, the book you did for Rebellion, uh, David Mogo, God Hunter, um, that uh, sort of blended. Uh, uh, how, to, how to describe it? Fra fantasy and uh, religion and contemporary society all all, all together in a, a, a in a unique setting. Um, do you see any parallels with that with with something like my tech, where it, it is a, it is a, a, a ridiculous fantasy concept, but nonetheless you you've got characters who are engaging with him as as if it was perfectly normal. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, that the thing is, um, I'm sure this. Op this obtains everywhere, but um, especially in especially in spaces that are um, underdeveloped um, or, or or less developed um, that are post-colonial um, that are that are still fledgling socioeconomically, sociopolitically, throwing in something right that as big as say my tech or you know in, in the case of the book uh gods uh, in the case of david mogul god hunter it doesn't it's like because like these places are still forming so it doesn't upend much instead what happens is that people tend to blend that into everyday experience after after a really short while and compared to say um societies or places that um, have had a long time of stability. And when you throw in one of these things, it tends to really upend the, you know, years and years of structure, right? Uh, and so the response is usually different. Uh, and I like to think about that every time I'm writing anything that has, that's speculative, you know, fantasy, you know, because folks are just like, well, if this comes to light, right? If, if, uh, if you drop a, a hundred foot, gorilla in New York, it's going to definitely raise a lot of eyebrows, uh, not just eyebrows, a lot of, <laughs> uh, and I'm sure you could say the same for a bunch of places, but what I know is the discovery of a hundred foot gorilla in West, and you know, pretty much any country in West Africa or Nigeria, like where I'm from, while it will have this massive, massive, um, it will cause this massive, massive change, it's gonna just happen over a really short while, and then people are just gonna, in the end, get with the program uh, and sort of, because you know, as I said, their lives are still in flux. They're still discovering themselves. They're still um, setting up their own structures. It, it's sort of gonna build around this new change, right? As opposed to reject it outright and try to do away with it. Really, what will tend to happen? Uh, and I like to sort of explore how that might happen in my stories regardless of what that massive change is uh, it could be you know in this case it's my tech uh, i haven't reached the point where i believe uh, folks are going to start getting okay with my tech but i believe that's not too far down the line um some point is going to come where everyone's going to be like well i guess we have a hundred foot gorilla around and we're just going to have to deal with that because that's kind of how we've dealt with every other upheaval in our societies, you know, since time immemorial. I mean, that, that's a really interesting point about um, the, 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 the impact on, I mean, something that, that, that sort of American comics and British comics have, have dealt with a little bit, you know, the impact on ordinary people and, and uh, them um, having to adapt their worldview in order to accommodate these ridiculous things um yeah. no I, I, I that's absolutely fascinating i mean it it certainly felt that way reading the strip that your focus was very much on you know, there's there's only so much uh mileage from writing about the actual solar powered robot the, the yeah. story is actually about people dealing with this stuff yeah yeah is this the first time that you've you've done comics i would say yes <laughs> actually um while I have written stuff for, um, I used to work in communications and sometimes um, we'd want to pass across a message and we would do so via a short comic strip maybe. Um, and, and, you know, just dabbled in writing scripts for art in some, but definitely nothing like this. Um, nothing uh, in this very manner. I was really diving into even the art, 
the, the style of writing for comics for the first time because other times I just like do it in a very non-traditional, very um, informal way. Um, I, I remember someone asked me what writing this comic was like and I said it's like writing a screenplay for static pictures, <laughs> for static images because that's what it was like. It's like, well, you think like it's a screenplay but then you have to think about how much uh, how much you can pa- information you can pass across in a still image, right? Um, and how much you can balance between words and actual actions in that still image, you know? So it was a very interesting and to me rewarding process because it taught, it taught me stuff about like the economy of words and the economy of, you know, an image, you know, it was, it was a very wonderful experience, I think, and hope that I get to do it over and over again. With uh, with a character like Mytek, as you said, we, we, we've uh, the decision has been made to to, to uh, acknowledge the past of the character, but not necessarily uh, deal with it. Um, Nigeria is is a is a country that that um, seems to do a lot of comics. There seems to be a thirst for comics there, you know, even, even stretching back to the 1970s when yeah. Brian Holland and Dave Gibbons were doing Power Man. and, and, and Yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> um, do, do you think this, this is a, a good kind of uh, crossroads and nexus for um, overcoming the colonial history of, of, of well, the colonialism inherent in a lot of these old comics that, that you know, you, you're, not, you're not erasing the past. You're just, you're, you're acknowledging it, you're, you're moving it on. Yeah, um, I think so. I think, I think, um, so comics in Nigeria, to start with, a lot of the literature in general in Nigeria is very, um, has very strong roots in politics. Uh, Most of the literature, early literature had very um, strong political focus, right? Uh, And then that has sort of, that over time, you know, to, in, in contemporary time, has sort of shifted into more uh, dealing with the concerns of, say, the average person, right? Um, but comics in particular have actually been very strongly linked to colonial influence from the comics that happened in uh, prior to the Civil War and after. Um, they had very strong roots in, in, in the colonial presence, right? And a lot of them actually faded out right after the, the right after independence and the civil war that came after it, because uh, a lot of the channels that were kept open between Nigeria and, and um, Britain were sort of severed. Uh, and so there wasn't really a lot of that back and forth. And so the amount of comics that were produced even by, say, other West African countries that sort of came into Nigeria, uh, that filtered, found their way into Nigeria, um, those lines were, like, cut. And so we didn't have a lot of comics for a long time. Um, that's how we lost Power Man. That's how we lost Captain Africa. That's how we lost a lot of them. Um, but then what has been happening in the last, say, 10-ish years is that there has been a resurgence, um, especially with folks from the diaspora now sort of coming back to contribute. Um, and and that's this, this is not just in Nigeria. This is across board. Um, the African Speculative Fiction Society is one of the societies that gives awards um, yearly for the best works by Africans. And there's a, there's a huge amount of um, there's a huge amount huge balance. There's a good balance of homegrown and diasporic co- um, comics coming out of you know each of these places. But it's still very very um, little. And and a lot of the also a lot of the comics that come from the diaspora have a sort of again um, outside in um, approach, which doesn't necessarily reflect the ex, you know the core um, existence of the everyday you know I, I can't say everyday African because Africa is like super wide, um, but the everyday experience of each person in each place, right? Um, and so. I am hoping that, you know, one of the comics like this sort of manages to straddle, you know, those two things, can balance that, can actually give you this very, you know, international-ish outlook, but it's from the inside out. Uh, And so you have that time to spend with the people on the actual ground. Uh, That's what, that's really my hope for my tech. And I hope that um, 
all of these new resurgent comics as well um, can manage to do that. Uh, some of them like, um, some of them like Shuri, I think, uh, the the new uh, Black Panther comics kind of manage, try to do that as well, sort of give you a um, balance of diasporic and, and um, local uh, perspectives. Um, there's also EXO, I think, it's a comic, I think, by Unique Studios. Um, the first one was something called, I think, The Legend of Wale Williams. It's about a superhero in Lagos. Something similar as well. Um, there are also some tiny animation companies springing up. So it's a very, really, really new and fledgling. And I hope that having something out there with, um, you know, someone as, uh, in, you know, as international permeative as, 2000 AD would sort of, uh, you know, send a larger message about what we're trying to achieve, uh, especially with that perspective and how we're trying to shift away from that very strong colonial influence on comics and how they have, you know, happened in, in Nigeria and West Africa, at least for what I know. What do you look for in a, in a comic? And, and how did you necessarily, uh, if indeed you did, translate that into... Uh, writing Might at the Mighty, while understanding it's a relatively short story. <laughs> yeah, Might at the Mighty is actually a short story, at least the first issue. Uh, I, I didn't really think about it like that until I had written it. I was like, oh, this is actually literally a short story. Um, um, what I really look out for in the comic, so I don't read a ton of comics. I read comics, but not a lot. And the reason is simple because I just didn't have access to them while I was growing up. And so I just didn't really get as much into them. Uh, I, I had more access to books and I read books more often. But I do read comics a lot of the time. And it turns out now that you mentioned I read more graphic novels because I just do not like incomplete. I'm, I'm like worried that I'd read one issue and never find it, um, which is literally how all the comics I read a full, big, complete arc. Uh, so, uh, and then I think I also, uh, because comics are also visual, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, we, we've, they sort of, how would I say this? They sort of compete with um, TV or movies in my head because I like to see more of the stuff I don't see on TV, right? So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm reading support as people, I want to see relationships. I want to see, um, you know, the social politics of things. Um, and what I, what I really guess I liked about all of them was that relationships were at the forefront, right? How people dealt with the uh, elements, you know, speculative or not, that sort of infringed on their daily lives and how they um, navigated that through their own personal relationships, you know, their dialogue, banter, uh, and, you know, more, as I said, the passive, what we'd see as the passive actions as opposed to you know the active ones of you know going out there and like going toe to toe with these things yeah that's kind of what i look out for and that's kind of what i'm trying to do with my tech as well like i know my tech is this massive giant robot and it's inevitable that he's going to meet another massive giant robot and they're going to have at it in the middle of a city that's inevitable um, but i'm like before we get there who are the people who have to to think about my tech who are the people who have to consider what my tech can be how, how what my tech can do for them or or if my tech even is a problem and why if if you were to okay. kind of look ahead and, and and do more um like you said it's inevitable that uh, my tech is going to become is going to get loose and cause lots of destruction but um have, have you got sort of one one eye on the future and, and an idea of where you would, you would take it if you had the opportunity? I would say one of the things I always think about is, uh, one of the things I've always been thinking about is my tech is, my tech is a symbol of power, right? Uh, my tech's is existence is, is a symbol of power for whoever is in control, right? Um, I think of it all the time, like all of these, say, nuclear powers, you know, folks are like, that's a nuclear power, you know, country. And so they wield a lot of influence politically, economically, you know, ETC. And I like to think about my tech in that way. Uh, it's not just about having a robot that can actually go out there and like, you know, fight or protect a city or, or do any of these things. It's about having power, right? So even when my tech is powered down in some factory, 
Um, I like to see the people who are in front doing the talking, who are like, well, we have a you know, solar power giant robot uh, and we can do anything, so we want this thing. You know, and how my tech can be used as a bargaining tool in that way. And then how those who are on the other side will try as much as possible to uh, ensure that bargaining tool is no longer existent, <laughs> you know, uh, or ensure that bargaining tool becomes theirs or ensure that they have a similar bargaining tool in that way. So I'm thinking about it more in that way because um, that's likely, that's most, much more likely to happen like today than than a giant robot, you know, just like strutting about. Um, so I'm thinking more and more about that and I expect that um, that's likely to happen uh, that's likely the direction that a lot of, you know, uh, the future of my tech, if I was to write more, uh, would take, you know, uh, would see like, say, uh, one, two thirds of that and one third of my tech punching another robot. <laughs>well huge thanks to Sui for that chat curtailed a little bit the internet decided to completely fade out so uh yeah a bit of an editing nightmare and would have liked a chance to chat more but uh these things are sent to try us now two creators who uh it was an absolute delight to be able to talk to with charlie hickson and charlie adler now they are the creative team behind the steel claw in the smash special um I'm sure you have absorbed uh, their work before, whether it was Charlie Higson's work on The Fast Show or um, his work on the Young Bond series. Uh, Charlie Adlard, droid of long standing, who uh, has, uh, has achieved a huge degree of popularity with The Walking Dead, but it's great to see him uh, back at his spiritual home. And uh, yeah, it was a delight to be able to chat to the two of them about their revival of The Steel Claw. Now, just as a little warning, Earthlets, there are severe spoilers in this chat. I've tried to keep them to a minimum, but uh, if you've not picked up the Smash special yet, then uh, maybe give this one a wide berth until you have. Um, otherwise, enjoy the chat with Charlie and Charlie. Um, first off, uh, this is... Well, when the editors at work told me what the lineup for the Smash special was, uh, my ears obviously very much pricked up when we talked about the Steel Claw, um, because you know uh, I, I I'm fans of both your mutual outputs. Um, how did this come about? How did you end up working on uh, Steel Claw for the Smash special, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the the guy got in touch with me and said, "Would I like to write something for it uh, for the Smash thing?" Um, I'd met him, what was his name now, what's his name? Keith. Keith, yes. Mm -hmm. I met him um, a couple of years ago, possibly more, at uh, some event at Forbidden Planet, I can't remember what it was, I might have been, when I was there, I did some stuff with Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson. Mm. Um, something like that, anyway. And, and we talked about stuff, and then he just got in touch with me out of the blue, just saying that, you know, that we're doing this, um, celebration of the smash or whatever uh, and I thought it was quite nice that it was celebrating that sort of British comic which is very different to American comics Wizard and Chips and Smash and uh, even the Beano and the Dandy you know that they don't do those kinds of comics in America so I thought it was quite nice was doing that and then you know the Steel Claw is one of those uh, iconic slightly crap British um, <laughs> British adventure characters that you know we, we never could do comics like the, well until really I suppose till 2018 came along but before that we, we you know our comics were not very good at doing the sort of action hero superhero type of things they were always a bit drab and um, uh, and a bit too British yeah and, and, and for me the steel claw sort of represented all that so it was quite fun to have to have a bit of a laugh with that, and I, just, I hope not too many people are going to be upset that I haven't taken too reverential an approach. But then I suppose. I mean, that's going to be a hell of a pull quote for uh, for any collection in the future. L little bit crap, but it's superhero. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, what, what, yeah. was, was never there were never, none of them were any you know as much as we remember them fondly from our childhood, I'm sure. But none of them, yeah, you know, especially in hindsight, you read them again. None of them were particularly. 
groundbreaking no. <laughs> in, their, in their storytelling and all the concept or anything like that. They're no, all like, oh, I mean, that's a rip off of X, yeah. you know, or whatever. We never really managed to come up with a, a British superhero who has lasted and people know about. I mean, unless you want to contradict me on that. What was the one that um, Alan Moore brought back briefly? Captain. Captain Britain. Uh, Cap well, he did Captain Britain. He also did yes. uh, Miracle Man slash Marvel Man. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Marvel Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there, you know, even, even in him doing it, there was a slight acknowledgement that they were slightly shit. <laughs> 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 but you know, in a sense, you know that that as I said before, two thousand AD. Even with two thousand AD, what was good is that there was still a very British slant on everything. Uh, the take on it. Uh, uh, the, presentation of those characters and that's what made it mm. interesting for me but but yeah but um before then you know british comics are different and and I, as i say I, I thought the idea of celebrating some of the, some of the more sort of britishness of our comics was a good idea uh, yeah. charlie uh, <laughs> I, mean, I can't Charlie. Say, like, Charlie, what about you? Um, so I, 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 Ch Charlie 2, Charlie A, whichever we want to go with. Mr. Radlard, there we go. Um, oh, yes, let's get official. Yeah. Let's call him Lynette. That's what it says on the screen. Oh, oh yeah, yes, my wife. I don't know why, why my wife has... I don't know why that's worked out. Can you think? <laughs> um, could you, you started your career with 2000 AD, didn't you? Yeah. Um, pretty much, Judge Dredd, The Hand of Fate, 10 page, fully painted strip uh, written by Alan Grant. Yeah. What, what year? Nine... We... Sorry? I was just going to say, what year you were about to say? 92, I think. I think it was 92. So I'm terrible with dates. It was roughly, it was roughly about that. Yeah, yeah, 91, 92, something like that. Um, yeah, so this is a carry-on of my association with uh, your wonderful British Weekly. <laughs> so what, but what comics had you been doing before that? That can't have been the very first thing you ever did. It was, yeah. Really? Just, well, I mean, I'd, I'd, um, my, my path towards being a professional comic artist was slightly circuitous in terms of I did, uh, similar to yourself actually, I, I was in bands and everything beforehand. And, and laughably tried to take it seriously for a, for a while when I was at art college um, studying film and video. So I tried to do that a bit. And then I tried to do the band stuff. Uh, no, I mean, no great shapes. None of it just worked out. It just didn't work out. And I ended up moving back home to where I live now in Shrewsbury in Shropshire, uh, which is where I was born. Um, almost as a like tail between my legs because I was living in London and everything. Um, and... Um, thought Christ what am I gonna do <laughs> you know uh, and um, kind of thought oh I used to draw you know I used to draw loads I read comics from you know the age of probably as we all did from the age of about six I remember my dad bringing home the mighty world of Marvel number one back in 72 I think it was um, and that that was sort of the scales falling from my eyes moment and everything Co coupled with starting to read Asterix as well um, and um, yeah, I just sort of about turned and started drawing again. And it took me about two, three years to break in after that. So I'm literally just staying, I was moved back to my parents and everything and just focused on drawing, you know, cause I had a, a few years of catch up basically. But yeah, I was just really lucky. I just had a, um, uh, what was that? What's the dinosaur, San Santanus Rex or something? Uh, Santanus. <laughs> Santanus, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd drawn a strip of that um, just as a tryout. And I remember taking it to the Glasgow Con at the time. That was the first time I sort of hit pay dirt because I was regularly going to, you know, UCAC, the old UCAC shows in London and the Glas, the Glascac ones up, up there as well. And um, yeah, just uh, got talking to Steve McManus. And um, he said, oh, that's right. And I've talked to Alan Grant already and showed him some work and he liked it. And I sort of cheekily said, 
if if the guys at two thousand like it, we'll we'll you know, can I say you'll write something? And he just went, sure, probably assuming that you know I wasn't going to get anything. And of course, so I said to Steve, um, oh, Alan Grant will write me a story, <laughs> and and he did, he did, he wrote the first uh, my first uh, first strip, and that was it. I haven't looked back since. Well, let's, let's talk a, a little bit more about the, the, the Steel Claw, because yeah. um, it is a character I've got a lot of fondness for. Um, not necessarily because he's crap, but... Um, <laughs> so, what, uh, what incarnation did you first come across him? Well, it was reprints of the Valiant stuff in right. the 1980s and 1990s. Like, I'd, um, there'd be, uh, in newsagents, there'd be like these weird kind of phone book, really cheap paper, thick reprints of just random stuff from the 50s, 60s and 70s. And I just, you know... They'd appear out of nowhere. I think I think they were just done on license. So it's it's the original Valiant stuff that I really like, the Jesus Blasco stuff. Mm. Um, when uh, he makes the transition, because he starts off being a villain. Yes. And then transitions to yeah. being a hero. I mean, Chad Higgs, what was what was your process in in choosing the Steel Claw to write about? Did did you? Did you have any direction or were you like, I do want to do him as a kind of... Well, uh, th that was down to um, Keith, who said he thought that perhaps the millennium would be a good period to set it. So that it was... It, it, which pleased me, because I didn't want to try and do a sort of modern uptake, modern update of it, a kind of reversion of it. I quite liked the fact that he was this sort of historical figure. So um, the millennium seemed to have a lot of stuff going on around the time that, that lent itself to a fun adventure. Um, and it was just taking that, that sort of him at his, I suppose, the most iconic sort of superhero thing of going up against the, uh, the villains with, with organisations with acronyms, which uh, <laughs> it's always seemed to be a ridiculous thing for a criminal organisation to do spend their time trying to work out a clever acronym. Yeah. Uh, when you're supposed <laughs> come to up with a name, come up with the acronym, come yeah. up with the acronym first and then fit the words. Yes. The, yeah. <laughs> Fear, okay, we're going to have to do some arson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just then, arson, then, nothing else, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to do a heist, you can't, it's not in the word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, all those sort of, conventions seem to sort of fit with the, with that sort of that slightly sort of clunky mm. square jawed nature of, of, of Steel Claw when he was fighting for, for British justice. <laughs> I mean you, you, you've got form with sort of secret agent stuff because you did the the, the Young Bond uh, mm. uh, series um, and re reading the the story in the Smash special it does feel very much that like, you're plugging into that kind of uh, slightly hokey British style um, spy kind of thing with just a, a little bit more, you know, action. Yeah, yeah, well, totally. I mean, you know, I mean, it was Ian Fleming who started the whole bloody um, acronym business with, with, with Spectre. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose Smirsh to a certain extent style, but, but Smirsh didn't mean anything, so it's, uh, yeah, Spectre. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was all tapping into a bit of a sort of classic... Um, Classic Bond, the sort of Fleming, Fleming Bond, well, even even the sort of sixties Bond gadgets and, mm. and the um, silliness. But I mean, the, the thing that, that the part of it that, that I got I I got quite excited about was it, was him going up against a series of uh, villains henchmen who each have their own enhanced body part, um, and 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 they sort of amalgamate into one sort of super being with the. Uh, what's he got? Iron lung, yeah. uh, concrete boot, uh, lead overcoat. Um, yeah. And I thought that was quite a nice image of, 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 of fighting this, this uh, creature of different parts. Mm. Because, it, because again, going back to his crapness, you know, what, what use really is a steel claw <laughs> yeah. in, in this modern world? It's, it's not a lot you can do with it. I mean, the invisibility part is, 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 is more useful, except his bloody claw. Uh, okay. it stays visible, so even that's a bit crap. Uh, but uh, I, I always loved that that notion of that being like a stealth thing that he can make himself invisible, apart from the very oh, hand. Hand. yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
it just turns into Cousin It, doesn't it? Yeah. A mechanical <laughs> version of Cousin It. But we, we always, uh, myself and a group of friends, we always used to say that it was, when you're drawing, you know, the classic dead body in the foreground or whatever, it would always be the hand in the foreground, you're sort of bent mm-hmm. and gnarled or whatever. But if you try to draw a foot in the foreground, <laughs> it would always just have comedy value, wouldn't it? It has to be a hand. You can't draw any other body part apart from a hand. So I just kind of like the idea of the concrete boot because <laughs> it's just got, you know, instant comedy value, a shoe. <laughs> with the foot, all you can do with the foot is someone who's fallen from face first from a great height and it's just his, his sort of feet. Stick. Yeah, it's his two feet. Stick, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all Terry Gilliam's fault with the Monty Python boot, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> But no, I mean, you know, it, it's just made me think, actually, you know, if we did any more, uh, trying to hide when he's just a hand is like, you know, <laughs> fitted Long into, off into off something, yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> on a mantelpiece or a yeah. suit of armour or whatever. <laughs> um, it yeah. all has to conveniently go into a manor house, so there's a convenient yes. suit of armour, so we can <laughs> hide behind it to be the glove. But yeah. a manor house, I think, is a classic... Uh, scenario i think for a steel cluster yes <laughs> i mean you, you you would have to be really conscious of uh, where the hand was because you the natural instinct when you're hiding is to kind of you know that classic pose up against the wall with your hands kind of flush with the wall except yeah. that, against the wall yeah the hand just kind of you know disembodied <laughs> anyway um wait I, I, charlie I, I, you you um your style is very different to how it first was when you worked for 2000 AD, because uh, you used to do a lot of fully painted stuff. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, certainly the Dread stuff that you've done more recently, um, and uh, obviously that other popular series that uh, you know I won't necessarily uh, uh, mention the name of. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you've, you've very much kind of refined that down to a, to, to a, to a, a black and white line style. Um, I really want to get you on the podcast in the future to talk more in depth about your career. Sure. And everything. But um, with the uh, with that evolution to line style, just recently I chatted to Carl Critchlow, who went through a similar process that he was a fully mm-hmm. painted artist who then went, uh, well, he returned to his roots as a, as a, 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 a somebody with a, a clear line style. Yeah. Um, what was your rationale behind that? Was was it time, energy? Um, predominantly, well, first off, I was always more comfortable with black and white. Even it was just one of those things when I got into comics back in the early 90s, you know, it was, it was fashionable to paint, wasn't it? That was the thing everyone was painting. So it was only, fa- it was only, I was just, you know, another one jumping on the bandwagon. Um, but uh, I was never fully comfortable with it. Uh, even though I spent the first year and a bit just painting comics. Uh, but, um, yeah, I learned a lot on the job, put it that way. So, yeah, it was when I went back to black and white, it was a bit more, I was more comfortable with it. So it was a case of honing it down. But, yeah, it, it's, there is one reason there's black and white comics predominantly, and that's uh, because of time, isn't it? You know, not many artists can do a monthly book and colour it. There's, well, no one. I don't think anyone can unless they're doing it very, very, you know, sort of, uh, sort of economically, you know, can, you know, sort of pencil, ink and colour a book a month. So, you know, it, 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 was ju- it was just a matter of time. And yeah, obviously then, once I started drawing for American comic books, you know, that was pretty much a black and white medium. Yeah, you know, with a colorist. So you know that, that that's that's the route I I went down. Um, yeah, and obviously you know I had a reputation for being fast. So you know I could do the pencils and the inks very easily in a month. Hence, sixteen years of zombie nonsense. <laughs> Another great pull quote for a collection cover. I feel uh, there you go. <laughs> Wait, it, it, I mean it. it it's kind of perfect for, for something like Steel Claw because um, mm. it was uh, co create well, it's co refined, let's put it that way, because the original concept was, a, was an editorial one by Jesus Blasco, who uh, ended up being, according to Brian Bolland, ended up being a huge influence for, for, for him in, in his life. Right. And um, I kind of wanted to, to, to find out from you 
whether you drew any inspiration from the old stuff or whether this is the steel claw Charlie Adard style completely? Oh, no, I mean, I, I do get that inspiration. And I love, I mean, probably my favourite artist, British artist from that time is probably John M. Burns. Um, so I sort of try and channel him <laughs> more than more than anybody else. I just thought he had that beautiful line work of his is just I mean I can't believe he's still working he's got to be in his he's in his 80s 80s Jesus Christ um yeah and yeah he's still good he's still amazing yeah and and but back then back yeah the strength is strength back in the sort of you know kind of the 60s uh yeah I mean I know he obviously never did the steel claw at least I don't think he did um but you know, it would have been something, would have been perfect for that, you know, that sort of wonderful sort of 60s kind of style. Um, and, you know, I love, I love all, I do love all that sort of stuff. And that, that, that's why I decided to put in, you know, uh, after having read Charlie's script, you know, sort of stick in a load of, you know, electrotone effects and stuff like that. So you, you've got that kind of, you know, 60s vibe going on, a kind of a nice throwback. Um, you know, but I find actually it's not just, I'm sticking Letratone's effect as much as I can nowadays in anything, because I just love Letratone. But yeah, um, it's predominantly there. It was a perfect excuse to do something like that and to go try and do it kind of slightly retro, trying to trying to create that you know atmosphere of a 60s strip yet set in the millennium, like from the past to the future, what they're perceiving it as, but from our past. <laughs> <laughs> to say I did feel a bit bad um, I kept expecting Charlie to send me an email saying you've got far too many words and things going on to fit into this length of story so I was I was I was amazed you know that you did such a great job of it and it doesn't feel too sort of cluttered it's, it's always tricky when you well I mean, it's a bit tricky for me not used to writing for comics uh, so much but um trying to envisage how much you can, you can put. And they all say, they all say it's the hardest job in the world is writing short stories. Yes. Um, and, you know, whether it's in whatever medium, but exactly. yeah, trying to write that six, eight page kind of, you yeah. know, and, and not, it's not even part of a big story. This is, you know. I know. I mean, and then the middle and end. <laughs> we have to set up the character for those people who didn't know him. Mm. You have to set up the story and the world. You have to put all the adventure, and I wanted to get some, some humour into it as well. So it was it was a it was a tough ask. So I was, I was very pleased with the the outcome. Well, I haven't seen the finished book yet. Collection. No, I can send yeah. you a PDF. Oh yes, please. I'd oh, like I, to see it I presume it was coloured. Was it? No. no. Oh right. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I, he's, he says, racking his brain. I'm pretty sure it wasn't coloured. All oh, right, okay, okay. I, I was just, uh, I was just presuming. I suppose you just presume it's going to be coloured, as in, you know, everything is coloured nowadays. So um, this is where I quickly run into. Uh, <laughs> oh, of course, it doesn't need colouring, but uh, here we go. Oh, if I don't know, I put even more electrotone all over. <laughs> <laughs> the spider, the Bolt, the Avenger. In the future. Yeah, it's black and white. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Excellent. I, actually, the biggest challenge I had was drawing Mick Hucknall. <laughs> I had to go through quite a few passes with him. It's weird because I thought, oh, he'll be easy. He's really distinct. But um, he's not looking like uh, Chucky the Killer Doll, if you're not careful. Yeah, he's an old. That's an old face he's got. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, at any time, of course, I was, when I was Google image searching his face, I mean, poof, what he looks like nowadays as well. <laughs> That's quite shocking. It, it, <laughs> With them, um, like, I want to come back to a point that Charlie Higson uh, made right at the beginning of our chat about um, reverence and sort of not wanting to, to, to necessarily be too reverent uh, with, 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 with the character. Um, there was the, uh, and we mentioned this on the podcast before because we've been talking about um, uh, uh, characters um, that have been featured before in reboots. There was a, the, 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 the action special in the 1990s that really did, you know, you got Mark Miller and John Smith and people like that really laying into these characters. I think um, 
uh, uh, Lewis Crandall the Steel Claw becomes a government assassin because obviously he can make himself invisible and he's got missiles and stuff in his in his hand. So that was very much not not just not reverential. It was also kind of sticking the boot in um, with something like this. It, it, is is there an inherent kind of camp comedy about British superheroes that you kind of can't avoid? You can't be po faced about them. Well, I, I, I think there is a bit because, you know, I mean, you go back to the sort of 50s and 60s and they, they always were a bit sort of plodding and it was all about doing the right thing and doing it for, for Britain and the empire and stuff. And, and there wasn't the edge that you got in American comics. There, there wasn't, they didn't have any anxieties or, or, or any hang-ups. Um, they were just square-jawed um, heroes. I mean, you know, I've always thought with James Bond that, that, that we were very lucky that, uh, because Ian Fleming from the start wanted to get films made. He knew if the character was going to have any longevity, he had to get him up onto the screen. And he tried desperately all through the 50s to make a James Bond film. And, and thank God he didn't, because a 1950s James Bond film would have been just awful, some awful clunky cheap black and white thing with someone like Stuart Granger or some really boring English yeah. actor playing James Bond and, it, and you know it would have been very clean cut and, and it's some 50s suit and that probably would have been the end of the character you know it wouldn't, it wouldn't be where he is today but you know it, it, the timing came right that managed to do it in the 60s where everything was much more cynical and cool and hip and the suits were pretty spectacular and mm. you know, he could be this kind of anti-hero this is sort of flippant assassin that he is um, and you know it bombed in the 1960s it was kind of inseparable um, and and you know that was a big change for the sort of type of, of, of British hero that, that we did um, and yet we never really managed to do it again um, you know the Americans took took it and ran with it and, um, you know, the, the Britain, we went back to the 70s, it all went very grey, it was kitchen sink dramas, it was heavy realism, and, and it, 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 this country doesn't lend itself to those sort of flights of, of fantasy uh, that you need, a sense of scale that you need to tell a big action adventure story, really big, certainly with a big sort of superhero character. So, you know, that sort of boxy, cramped 1960s newspaper strip comic style. That, that's how I sort of think of the, of the steel claw of, of being stuck in that, that world. Um, I suppose the sort of John M. Burns world in, in many mm. ways. Um, so, so that's what I was trying to sort of channel in, in the strip. It's, it's interesting what you say about the, the um, kind of the focus of the strips being relatively small as American superheroes are, are, have a much grander scale, much bigger. Um, I always love the, um, the characters who um, are saving the church fate and, yeah. are, you know, yeah. saving the 523 from Peckham. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> That's as big as it gets, yeah. yeah it, 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 that, that, that sums it up. It's just that sort of healing comedy approach to yeah. crime stories. <laughs> it's not, and I, I'm not using this word uh, as a pejorative, but it, 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 it's parochial. It feels smaller and actually kind of more personal in a way. Mm. You think? I did, with, with, with a character like the Steel Claw, uh, you know, there's a, there's a kind of, there's a macabre element to it, I think. Um, but also the, the, the kind of, by being a character who operates within a British frame, within a British sensibility. It, it, uh, does it keep the focus small? Does it keep the focus personal? Or, or is, is it just parochial as a pejorative, do you think? Well, I, I, I just think that that's the nature of so much British storytelling. Um, and again, you know, going back to how 2018 sort of broke out and created its own world, really. Um, <laughs> That hadn't been so far. You know, as I was saying, what I was saying about like James Bond is we entered the big sort of bloody international jet setting adventure story with James Bond, and then the Americans took it over and we stopped doing it. And uh, yeah, English stuff is very broken. And you know, in the TV work, I've always been trying to bring back 
the sort of fantasy stuff that I loved watching in the 60s, where we had the Avengers and um, the Champions and Adam Adamant and the Prisoner and all these sorts of things. And we sort of led the world with that. And then it just died in the 70s. It became heavy realism, it became all that we're allowed to do, and you know, other than Doctor Who. And you know, when I, whenever I've tried to bring it back, I've, I've, I've I've come up against a brick wall or people just don't know what to do with fantasy in this country. Uh, and, you know, you try and do a crime story and there's a car chase and people sit there going, oh, no, you can't turn left there. That's a dead end there. You know, that's a one way. <laughs> you have to go up by the post office and around the back of Aldi. <laughs> you no, know, you, in America, you've got fucking great deserts, mountains and vast cities and you can tell any kind of great big expansive story but you just I think, I think i think you're right that that's the product of where we live isn't it it's it's the geography of our little island and it is a tiny little island in comparison and um you know does that give us tiny little ambitions as well i don't know but we we've <laughs> yeah we we i don't know yeah it, i suppose it feels like you know you could drive from, you know, John O'Groats to, to Land's End and the landscape doesn't actually change in terms of from desert to fields to whatever. You know, it's kind of green. You might get mountains, you might get cities, but, you know, in terms, the actual landscape is, is, is the same. And, yeah, I don't know if that has given us that sort of, you know, I don't I hate to say this small islander mentality, but... What? I think it does, you know. I mean, in terms, in terms of entertainment, you know. Our, um, our, our wildest place is called the Lake District. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a like yeah. half a desert, is it? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It burns <laughs> gulch or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, even... Um, it's that, it's that, it's that, but it also comes up against this British obsession with, with realism, that things have got to be real. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, which, which I find infuriating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, was um, I mean, if you're talking just fantasy as opposed to spies and whatnot, I mean, um, was his dark his dark materials was British, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's a kids kids book. You're allowed to do it in kids book. You're allowed to do it in kids stuff. Yeah, yeah, you've done, yeah. You've done the most influential fantasy kids books of anyone, you know, either Harry Potter, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, or The Rings. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's dark materials, but it's fine to do that because they're kids' books. Yeah. That's for kids. I mean, it's like when they did the, the TV adaptation of his dark materials, it, it didn't really take off because I think the people making it, the way it was presented, there was that, is this a kid's story or are we telling an adult story? Who's mm. supposed to be watching it? Um, whereas the Americans would just make the bloody thing. You know, they, they, they turn out fantasy all the time, science yeah. fiction, fantasy. Um, non-stop, they don't seem to have a problem with it, but, but here it's like, mm, that's a kid's, kid's show, isn't it? Mm, there does seem to be a specific, yeah, like for Doctor Who, for instance, there does seem to be a specific audience just for Doctor Who. Whereas, like you say, in America, if, it was, if there was a similar fantasy science fiction show in America, it wouldn't be so pigeonholed, I don't exactly. think. But yeah. also, they don't really have... On, on sort of network TV, they don't really do kids TV. They don't have those slots. Right. You know, there are kids channels, but they tend to be, you know, Disney kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, it was interesting that um, uh, Stephen, what's he called? Scottish fellow, who took over running Doctor Who. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Stephen Moffat. Maybe Stephen Moffat. Yes. <laughs> no, he very much, when he was doing Doctor Who, he started angling it towards an American market, towards the online mm. uh, market, and, and, and did extremely well in that area, uh, and, and got it more popular and better known in America, but slightly lost the hardcore British family audience. <laughs> I got him, I think that's when I bailed as well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, again, something the Americans do better than we do. Well, they're a machine, you know. They got they actually do have a, a, a you know a showbiz industry. Mm. Uh, 
show the show business is a business there and they take it incredibly serious and they're very good at it they know how to structure something to pull you in and to draw you in and here it's much more of a sort of a, a cottage industry of individual writers doing their own thing so we make some brilliant stuff it's very different to what the Americans yeah. do absolutely yeah. Wait, and, and <clears throat> I read in uh, some interviews with uh, Charlie Higson um, where you've recommended uh, things like Nemesis the Warlock and Charlie's War um, as as good British comics. What it is what is it about those strips that that makes you think they're they're a kind of best of British? They're they're, they're the things that you would recommend. Well, I mean, God, that's a huge question. <laughs> I mean, Nemesis the Warlock, I just loved. I mean, the writing of it was bonkers. The artwork was bonkers. The whole idea of this warlock being the central character. What the hell was he? Um, and yet the stories were really involving and, you know, they were, they were great to, to read. And, and, you know, you just think reading that, there's no one else. This is not like an American comic at all. But it was also not like a British comic. So uh, I loved it on, on that front. Um, Charlie's War, I think, was, a, was, was in some ways, a, it was a sort of transition from the old school British comics. Um, which, where we did a lot of kind of war comics and, and that kind of thing, uh, into the more modern, sort of modern sensibility that you get in, in, in 2018, so I think it's a good transition. I mean, and I, you know, I've, I've, I've always loved comics, as, as Charlie was saying earlier, you know, I started reading them as young as I can remember. I mean, but also, you know, I don't, I never saw a Marvel comic as a kid. They, you just couldn't get them. They weren't around, and so it wasn't, you know, I was a kid during the 60s. Um, I didn't really see one until, it was probably late late 60s, early 70s, where a friend had a American dad or something and started, started bringing them. So, you know, all you had was those those British comics. And to, to us, a comic meant Dino, Dandy, Wizard and Chips, things like that. Um, so. I can't remember where I'm going with this, but yeah, I mean, I always have loved reading comics and I've loved trying to champion comics. And, you know, because I write for kids and teenagers, I do a lot of work with like the National Literary Trust, Literacy Trust and, and, and bodies trying to get kids to read. And I always do keep trying to mention comics and saying, look, this is reading, there's words in comics mm -hmm. um, and we shouldn't be sniffy about it. And so the, the thing I wrote about Charlie's War was it, they, they were, it was one of the anniversaries of the First World War, bringing out a big book, and it was like stories for kids to read about the war, and I wanted to put a comic in there. Um, it's a great way to get kids to read about stuff. And, you know, Charlie's War did deal with some very emotional things, and, you know, it got involved in the characters a lot. So, um, yeah, so whenever I can, I will try and promote comics. And, you know, when people say, what did I read as a kid? I always mention Asterix and Tintin were huge books for me as a kid mm. um, <laughs> so 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 yeah I, you know I've, I've always tried to promote comics as, as, a, as a great way for, for to get into reading and to get into the idea of storytelling and, and myth making and all that kind of stuff so. I, I suppose there's one similarity between Charlie's War and Nemesis if we're just using those two and I think that's cynicism isn't it the classic British yeah. cynicism yeah, which Americans can't do. That's one thing they can't do, whereas we do brilliantly, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, both those were laced with it, you know, throughout. Yeah. And yeah. Some religious intolerance, you know, that's really what it was all about. It was, um, yes. So, yes, on one sense, on one level, you have these sort of straight laced British heroes, and then you've got this sort of anxious American superheroes. But again, you know, in terms of being actually subversive, probably there's more going on in, in, in British comics than in America. Hmm. It, 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 that nicely brings me back to, to a character like Steel Claw, because um, like I say, he, he started off as a villain uh, and then later on became a hero. And, there, uh, and we've discussed it before on the podcast that there is this tendency in um, British comic book characters of the 60s uh, and 70s especially of the bad guy being the hero, you know, it, it, the, the, um, or at least quite sinister or quite odd. 
um you know there's there's always <laughs> always got to be something slightly wrong with my one of my favorites is janice stark who was you know a, an escapologist <laughs> yeah Oh, I forgot yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. We just brought out two sort of thin collections of his uh, of his strips, and that kind of gothic uh, something unsettling about it. And and like I say, you know, you get a character like the the Steel Claw, and it's macabre. There's a floating hand. <laughs> yeah. No, well, that's it. It's it's it's. Um... Yeah, I, I think I think we do definitely um, thrive in the oddities and the weirdness and things like that more than yeah uh, yeah American stuff is a lot more I suppose for one of better words straight laced uh, it, it's just down you know kind of just close its own furrow down the middle kind of thing you know um, arguably up until about, you know, sort of 10, 15 years ago with the yeah, advent of how we're, what we're calling the TV's golden age and of everything of, you know, HBO, Netflix, et cetera, et cetera, which, you know, suddenly, suddenly they can be more adventurous. But before then, you know, we were the, we were the sort of the, the jaded isle that sits across the Atlantic sort of, you know, pouring scorn on anything that's, um, uh, again for want of a better word wholesome <laughs> and um you know and the, yeah the americans are pumping all that sort of stuff out and we're just yeah sort of pumping the anti-wholesome back you know <laughs> yeah I, I i like the fact that this strip is um set at the millennium which is kind of one of those cultural touchstones where um optimism tried to meet that traditional British cynicism and you know you, you've, the, you're, you've set it at the Millennium Dome which is the ultimate symbol of somebody trying look, look at this lovely shiny kind of um, let's recapture the spirit of the 1950s when everybody was more hopeful and the ultimate, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate ballsing it all up <laughs> wasn't it the Millennium Dome <laughs> ultimate symbol of Britishness surely yes yes <laughs> The world's the, the biggest flop, wasn't it? It was just, it was just. I mean, it's amazing. You know, obviously we've managed to turn it around thanks to you know the O2 now what it's called. You know, but God, I remember the controversy surrounding that. You know, yeah, no, and it, I, I, know I, went, I was going, I was sort of reading reports, contemporary reports, when I was writing the strip, and you know what went on on that New Year's Eve night where all the guests got stuck in. Stratford Station, and they, there was a problem with the tickets, and nobody could get there. It was just, it was, it was a magnificent ball song. And then you think what tawdry entertainment they had when you actually got there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we we are we are going to get savaged in the comments on this. I I fear, but. Uh... <laughs> But yeah, right. I, well, I, I, I kind of want to round it off now because um, I've, I've been keeping you guys too long. But uh, this this has been fascinating because um, Steel Claw is one of those characters that everyone kind of name checks as one of those classic characters of, of, of the, the, the 50s and 60s, especially. And um, it's been really nice to see your together. Having, having seen the take from the 1990s, which was ultra cynical, mm -hmm. um, for you guys to sort of bring him back and, and do something a, a little bit different. In terms of looking to the future, it, uh, is it a character that you, you think actually we'd quite like to continue this? It's, there's, there's a lot of material there to work with. I have no idea. I mean, we should see it'd be great if you could get, you know, for me, it would be fun to get new readers. Mm. And you, I, I wouldn't have any interest in it really just being a sort of nostalgia thing or a comic mm. geek thing of like, mm, you yeah, know, I'm gonna get this because it's the steel claw. Um, but that's a tall order. I think, I think you could probably do something longer form with it, but I, I don't know, again, like Charlie said, I don't know, I really like Charlie's approach. I was really happy to do what Charlie wrote because I, I'm frankly bored with dark, gritty versions of everything it's just it's just become its own cliche now and you know as soon as I hear those words I just instantly turn off now you know 
oh, it's a dark, gritty telling. I think she's like, oh, Christ. You know, and um, no, is it now? Really? Well done. You know, and, uh, you know, you just got to do something else, something, something different, something. Yeah, it's nice to be a bit more lighthearted. <laughs> you yeah. know, says he who's just spent 16 years drawing <laughs> zombie horror. But, but it, it's exactly that's my point. You know, I want to do. I personally want to do different stuff now. I don't want to get pigeonholed into the same. You know, I'm not. You know, <laughs> I'm quite a happy individual. I'm not one of these cynical types that you know only wants to do you know sort of dark gritty retellings of you know sort of popular characters um so yeah I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what else is in the book actually see yeah. what other, other people's takes on other characters are i uh, i mean to be brutally honest i don't think there's much of a life beyond i think as charlie was implying much of a life beyond what we've done just because I, I think you'd need to take that character and just completely tear it apart and reform it I to mean, attempt to do something like that, you know? If I, if I was going to embark on a, on a, on a longer form comic thing, I'd, I'd be more interested in, in trying to do something completely new. Uh, hmm. so, so my own. Um, I think, you know, I have a lot of fun with Steel Claw, but uh, it's only ever going to be, you know, Having done um, James Bond for several years and written things like Agatha Christie, they're great fun to do, but you don't want to get stuck doing them forever. Well, that's that's. I've always said. People always say to me, you know, after The Walking Dead, what, what, what you know, who do you? Who, they all say they don't say what do you want to do next. They all say who do you want to work? Who would you like to work on next? And I always say, similar to you, I always say, uh, whatever I create next. I'm not interested in doing Spider-Man or, you know, X-Men or, or I don't know, Batman or whatever. Doing it for a tiny amount of time is kind of fun, like you say, you know, it, it, it's, it's, that's kind of refreshing and it's a nice break from the norm and it sort of just refuels you for whatever. But if, you, if I'm going to spend a year plus on something, I, it's, it's, I mean, I'm, I, I got to admit, I'm speaking from a position of extreme privilege, of which I'm very lucky to have been part of The Walking Dead and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, and I'm privileged to be in that position to be able to say that. But yeah, it would always have to be something I create with a, a writer or something like that. Um, Sorry, <laughs> it, it's just more. We, we, we're not. We're not in charge, mate. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> well, thank you to C and to Charlie and to Charlie for chatting away. Absolutely delightful to speak to them all. That's all for this episode of the 2008 Forecast Lockdown Tapes. Please do subscribe on the podcast app of your choice or go along to youtube.com forward slash 2000AD online to uh, subscribe, like, follow, etc, etc. Help spread the word. Let people know uh, all about the 2000AD Thrillcast, whether they're comics fans or not. We hope you enjoy uh, these lockdown tapes as uh, we continue having to be uh, uh, working from home and, uh, well, in the sub-sub-sub-sub-sub basement of the 2000AD Nerve Centre. Um, stay safe, look after each other, and as always, we really look forward to seeing you all on the other side of this. Until next time, Earthlets, Splendid Verthwick. Power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or news agent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.